Good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Tonight, I'm doing a video on celiac disease, namely how celiac disease relates to other autoimmune diseases. I'll briefly go over celiac, and um, I hope to provide you with some more information on the topic as it pertains to some subtle blood test findings that maybe you've had and you question if you have celiac disease or, um, you know, a friend who has iron deficiency and they're wondering, uh, maybe they have celiac. What does it mean? How do you diagnose celiac? I'll go into some of that and I'll probably do a more in-depth full broadcast on celiac later this week or next week. Uh, the topics that I'm going over tonight come from this article. Uh, namely, this author right here, Alicio Fasano, is the world's foremost researcher on gluten. And hello to everyone who's joining. So anytime you see an article by Alicio Fasano, you want to pay attention. Lead author here is Chow. Uh, the title of the article was Celiac Disease, a Comprehensive and Current Review in BMC Med. Uh, it came out in 2019. So I'll post this link uh, for the YouTube video, but uh, just want to always offer that for those who are interested. So again, we're talking about celiac. Here are my credentials and we're going to bring this one in. So celiac disease is uh, a really interesting condition. I I've talked about it before. Uh, in essence, it used to be really uncommon. Maybe it was underdiagnosed. Maybe it's overdiagnosed. Now, but nonetheless, it seems to account for about 1% of the American population. It has a female preponderance, and it may just be the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. And as we had one comment that just popped up uh, about non-celiac gluten sensitivity, that's a whole other ball of dough, so to speak, or ball wax, where uh, it gets a little nuanced. There's a lot of debate surrounding uh, it's, it's causation, it's legitimacy. Uh, is it a spectrum disorder, so to speak? So some people are mildly affected. Some people are more severely affected. Some people have lab test signs that indicate they have a problem with gluten. Others just feel good being on a gluten-free diet. So that is non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which being frank is extremely important for neurological disorders in my experience. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity is nothing to ignore. With that being said, um, relative to celiac, we just need to kind of know what celiac is. So maybe we have a place to work from uh, when we talk about gluten. So uh, here we have a nice diagram of what was referred to as classical celiac disease, non-classical celiac disease, and subclinical celiac disease. As you can see here, subclinical celiac disease is basically uh, comprising people who have no symptoms, but they have the testing to indicate that they do have celiac. Those with classical have the diarrhea, the weight loss, the malabsorption. They may have uh, inability to gain weight, cachexia, they're losing weight. Uh, in a child, this may manifest as failure to thrive. This comprises this quote unquote classical celiac disease, um, what we call celiac sprue <clears throat> in pathology. So uh, a lot of diarrhea, weight loss, just malabsorption. And then we have non-classical celiac disease as they talk about it here. And these are individuals who have constipation, anemia, osteoporosis, hypertransaminesemia. <laughs> I don't know if we misspell that. Basically they're transaminases are uh, are high neurological disorders dermatitis herpetiformis so these are other conditions throughout the body being affected by the celiac disease process now the authors from this article that I'm, I'm talking about they propose that we more talk about intestinal versus extra intestinal manifestations meaning in essence celiac disease in children prototypically manifests as what we used to call celiac sprue, this classical celiac disease presentation, diarrhea, weight loss, malabsorption. However, in kids above the age of three, and particularly in adults, you can have a wide uh, variety of different symptoms that are presenting. It may present just as irritable bowel syndrome. 
namely constipation, alter alternating with diarrhea, some dyspepsia, some feeling of acid in the stomach, maybe some nausea. It may manifest as diarrhea, mainly just constipation. It may manifest just as depression. Not just, but it may manifest as depression. It may manifest as ataxia, problems with balance. Uh, so that's where it's so important to have one's antennas up anytime someone presents with nebulous gastrointestinal and or neurological symptoms. So hopefully that kind of gives you an overview of, of what celiac disease presents as. And then in terms of diagnosis, uh, basically the diagnostic criteria, are, they say are four out of the following five. Uh, an individual has to have these symptoms that I mentioned. Typically there's going to be uh, a genetic predisposition through the HLA DQ2 and DQ8 genes. Uh, on that topic, about 25 to 35% of the population has celiac disease genes. So that's really, really important. So just because you test positive for celiac disease genes does not mean that you have celiac disease. In fact, out of that 25 to 35% of the population, around then 3% of those individuals actually have celiac disease, which somehow translates, as you can imagine, into 1% of the population. Uh, then we're going to have laboratory signs of celiac disease. So namely, the tissue transglutaminase IgA is the gold standard uh, blood test in conjunction with the anti-endomycel antibody. And those are blood tests that you may have had run or deaminated gliadin antibodies. Um, but basically the TTG IgA and the endomycel antibodies have the highest sensitivity and specificity together for diagnosing celiac from a lab perspective. On the topic of gliadin antibodies, um, what we're finding, and some of my patients have found this out this year, it's actually hard to get just regular gliadin antibodies tested anymore. Most labs have transitioned, particularly LabCorp, into the deaminated uh, version of gliadin antibodies because the deaminated gliadin antibodies are more specific for celiac, whereas gliadin antibodies can be seen in non-celiac gluten sensitivity and other autoimmune disorders. So for whatever reason, basically now we're just left with the deaminated version. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the fourth element of the five is the intestinal biopsy. Typically we're gonna see villus atrophy. So think of uh, your small intestines as having these little finger-like projections, kind of like a sea anemone. They're called the intestinal villi. And we typically see that there's blunting or there's atrophy of the villi. There's also excessive immune cells within the villi, so it's called intraepithelial lymphocytosis. And we may see crypt hyperplasia. So down here are the intestinal crypts, metaphorically, or the analogy, so to speak. And the crypts tend to uh, degenerate as well. And so those are the histological signs of celiac. And then the fifth criteria is going on a gluten-free diet and feeling better. Now, not everyone with celiac disease goes on a gluten-free diet and feels better. That's called refractory celiac disease, particularly if somebody's off of gluten for more than one year and they're still not feeling well. Um, if that's you, then you really want to watch the next broadcast because I'm going to talk about that a lot and how it relates to the gastrointestinal bacteria and other things you probably want to have checked. So with all that, out there, um, what I will say in my clinical experience, it's really, really important for clinicians and patients, if you start seeing signs of microcytic anemia, meaning maybe your hemoglobin is low, your hematocrit is low, and then when you look on your complete blood count, your MCV and MCH may be low. Those are signs of iron deficiency. There are many different causes of iron deficiency. Um, Again, in no way is this video meant to diagnose you or, or giving you medical advice. It's just giving you information. Talk to your doctor about it. But if a person has seen these signs of anemia, maybe low red blood cells with this microcytic pattern, low MCV, then you may want to think, is celiac disease a potentiality? I picked this up in a lot of individuals. 
Also, it can go the other direction. So an individual may present with macrocytosis because they're not absorbing their B12. Go back and watch the B12 broadcast I just did last week. And so their red blood cells are getting really big because when you don't have sufficient B12 and or B9 in your bloodstream and your bone marrow, your red blood cells don't develop properly because you can't basically make DNA properly. And as a consequence, you get these huge red blood cells called macrocytosis. So um, those are important features to watch out for. So that's why I have here iron deficiency, macrocytic anemia. Um, also depression and anxiety are hugely important and tied in with celiac disease and gluten problems. And I think this pretty well summarizes it. Okay, so now we're going to hide that guy. And then did they fix that blood test yet? No, not to my knowledge. So we're still having the deaminated uh, gliadin antibodies rather than having both options, particularly through LabCorp. Now, this diagram from the article I mentioned uh, has, it struck me when I looked at this because even though I knew most of this, seeing how many disorders are at least associated with celiac disease uh, is pretty striking. So we have type 1 diabetes. So these are these young individuals who develop sudden onset diabetes because their insulin function has been pretty much completely sacrificed by their immune system attacking their pancreas. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So where the immune system attacks the thyroid. Graves disease, the immune system attacks the thyroid but binds, the immune cells bind to the TSH receptor. Autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cholangitis, referred to as PBC, that's under the umbrella of autoimmune hepatitis conditions. Same thing with the primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is an autoimmune form of hepatitis that largely affects men. Uh, it's typically fatal, dermatitis or pediformis, vitiligo, Addison's disease, that's autoimmunity to the adrenal glands, alopecia, loss of hair, psoriasis, IgA deficiency, autoimmune atrophic gastritis, so I did a broadcast recently on that. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia, Sjogren syndrome, dry eyes, dry mouth, scleroderma. These are individuals who develop calcinosis. They have Raynaud's. They have a variety of features that probably you won't um, uh, have a lot of familiarity with. But if you've ever heard of someone having morphia or sclerodactyly, those are components of scleroderma, systemic uh, or should be systemic lupus erythematosus, polymyositis, rheumatoid arthritis, mycenia gravis, Berger's disease. So there's all these autoimmune conditions that are associated with celiac disease. But you may be saying, well, I don't have celiac disease and I have gluten sensitivity. And I'm here to tell you that our understanding of celiac disease is really solid in the last 20 years. Again, before that, it wasn't recognized nearly as much. It was recognized, but particularly in the last 20 years, we just has had, had this explosion of research about it. And if you have one of these autoimmune diseases, you know someone with one of these autoimmune diseases and they should be aware of gluten, but maybe this is a good chance for everybody just to have a little reminder of how connected gluten is to so many facets of our immune system. Probably that stems from the fact that each of your intestinal cells are bound together by these tight junction proteins and the gliadin protein, which is basically indigestible, breaks down your zonulin occludin complex, which is your tight junction protein. So gluten functions as a toxin for your intestinal proteins. So that's really important for us all to know. And we know that the gut connects to autoimmune disorders and so many other inflammatory disorders. So this is nice to see. Um, let me see that. And then, uh huh. And we're having some great chats here, great comments. Uh, also, celiac disease is connected to other heart conditions, epilepsy, cerebellar ataxia, peripheral neuropathy. Last year, I did a whole talk on. Uh, neurological connections to gluten problems, probably not a bad idea to revisit that, but we do see that the cerebellum, the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum can atrophy in individuals who have immune reactions to gluten. 
again, connections idiopathically to multiple sclerosis, cerebral atrophy, uh, sarcoidosis. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And then these chromosomal abnormalities, uh, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Williams syndrome, they can actually predispose someone to having uh, problems digesting gluten and having immunological intolerance to it as well. So I think that's a good little entry into celiac disease. We went over kind of the diagnostic classification. I can go into that more if you want me to. Uh, so just let me know. But also kind of being aware that celiac disease doesn't just present with diarrhea. It can present with depression and constipation and all those other symptoms I mentioned. If you know someone who has chronically low iron and they can't figure it out, or they have chronically low B12 and they can't figure it out, thinking about celiac disease may be something positive in the discussion with one's doctor. So yeah, I hope this uh, broadcast will transform into another article coming up. Uh, that I'm just, I'd love to see these articles getting out there. And uh, I would love all of your thoughts. I really appreciate the comments I get on YouTube and Facebook because it helps me to give you pertinent information that I may think is common and it may not be common or I may be talking about things that everybody else is talking about. So if I can talk about the uniquenesses of these topics, it helps me too. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a good Wednesday night and I will be back soon.